Um, thank you very much for all of your questions. I've got lots of them here. Um, I'll see what we can get through before 10 o'clock. Um, I, I think the first question I'd like to actually pose to Ronnie, um, and that's, uh, I know you haven't heard the presentations here this morning, Ronnie, um, but perhaps you could uh, tell us what you believe are the main legal challenges in terms of managing large, complex projects. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, as with any major undertaking, the thing that you know, strikes one is that the challenges will be peculiar to the situation that you're dealing with. And I think actually one of the things that I've noticed over the years in dealing with situations after they've gone wrong is that it is frequently the case that people have approached planning for the project or documenting the project based on prior experience, which seems to them to be broadly applicable or similar but actually, which has certain quirks that mean it's inappropriate to do something in this particular project. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, I'm thinking of a project, current very significant project, in which the uh, consortium which was planning for it purchased um, some equipment for the project on the standard terms of the supplier. Now, they knew at the time they placed the purchase order that it would be at least 36 months before that equipment was installed and put into use. And yet they contracted on terms that said that there was no warranty as to the quality of the goods after the earlier of 12 months into production or 15 months after delivery. So it was immediately apparent, had they thought about the timeline of that project, that their uh, warranty period would have expired 15 months after delivery, but it would still be over a year before they would ever be using the equipment and seeing whether it worked or not. Now that is a very simple but classic example of something which was inappropriate to the particular circumstances of the contract that they had before them. I think a second thing, if I can give you a, a, just another example, I might leave it at two, which um, people are uh, not entirely sensitive to um, is that projects can change in the way that they are executed from the manner in which they were initially planned for execution. And what we often find is that whilst situations have been documented and thought through perhaps perfectly adequately in the world which was the kickoff date. It's often the case that people don't really give consideration to what are the implications of changes which are effected over the course of execution. So to take an example, you might start with a situation where company A is proposed to be the operator and has various contractual indemnities. But over time, by a course of dealing or by some sort of arrangement between the parties, another entity comes in to operate. And they're not operating on the basis of any written terms that have been agreed, the assumption may be made that warranties and indemnities and so forth amongst consortium members and between non-operators and operators will simply be read across. But that can be, from a legal perspective, a false assumption. And again, I think that the two points that one would make there is that uh, it's very, you know, companies periodically will say, well, let's have an audit of our contracts let's see our standard terms and conditions. It's actually good practice to audit the documents and the, you, you know, the, the, as it were, the, the blueprint that you were starting off with sometime into every live project and to actually test and to test amongst the consortium by asking the questions. You know, are we still working on the same basis of indemnities now that we've got a different operator? Do you accept that you have to indemnify the new operator the way you agreed to indemnify the old one? And it's, it, it's often the case that it isn't, isn't until after the problem comes that people actually step back and say, well, are we entitled to be indemnified? Did we ever agree to indemnify for this? You know, we agreed to indemnify for that, but then we asked them to do something different and they did it in a particularly obtuse way and so on. I think that, you know, those are two live examples I would give. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Um, the next question I have is uh, addressed to Robert. Um, you spoke about industry initiatives with some scepticism. 
Do you think the recent Wood Review will be more successful in making the UKCS an attractive and structured place to operate? Hold on a second. He said he doesn't know and I really don't know. I, honestly, we, nobody's got an idea. All initiatives so far in history have failed. So will this one work? I don't know. Um, I wouldn't say the track record is very good in the industry initiative, so let's wait and see. Mark, do you have any thoughts on the Wood Review? <clears throat> Last time we spoke about um, the Wood Review um, uh, was interesting, it was at the Scottish Parliament. And uh, the, uh, the comment was made by the, um, uh, the MPs, the SMPs, where, um, uh, was that the oil industry is an interesting industry uh, in, in, in the UK because it's the uh, bastion of capitalism. So the question I have is if it's the bastion of capitalism, then uh, this, this socialistic aspect of collaboration might not work um, in the manner that everybody thinks it might. So, uh, so yeah, so I think it's, a, it, you know, it's worthwhile, I think, pursuing the concept uh, whether it actually ever comes to fruition or not, I don't know. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the next question is, what can be done to improve contractor-operator relationships and what are the main reasons for differing views? And I'd like to go to Robert on this one. I don't know. I, I personally think three bottles of gin helps an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, apart from that, I mean, we've got to find a position where we can actually get aligned on our objectives. I mean, I think we've got to understand they're trying to make money on my back and I'm trying to make sure that the least amount, they make the least amount of money. So I think we've got to come to a point where, I, I would like to try a sort of risk-based contractual model, uh, which is nobody's ever tried before that I'm aware of, where we actually engage with our contractors and find out how they perceive their risks in bidding for a job and actually try to tailor the contractual model and take into account their risks. Um, and see which risks we're both best placed to deal with. I mean, I would never ask a contractor in the UK or even worldwide to run a rotating equipment contract because quite simply they don't know what they're doing. Um, they're specialist people who do know what they're doing. Um, I, would be ha I would be more comfortable in running that with my own project team than I would be giving it to one of the major contractors in the UK. So I think, I think it's a bit dialogue and honesty. Uh, the question is, uh, I'm prepared to be honest, but is everybody else around about the table prepared to be honest too? Okay, Ronnie, would you like to give a, perhaps a legal perspective on that question? Uh, well, I think um, allocation of risk is, um, an allocation of risk is interesting in a commercial context because the, the law starts from the proposition that if somebody causes harm they should compensate for it. And that's a very deeply ingrained attitude in our judiciary, and I think it's wise for those who are taking indemnities or exclusions of liability to be aware of it, that when cases get before judges, there is an extraordinary propensity for the judge to want to hammer the person whose negligence or breach of contract has caused harm and loss, and to read narrowly any provisions which are excluding liability for that. Um, one thing I, you know, do wonder about is whether people are making the best use of the insurance options which are available and the other options to lay off risk. I can see that in certain contexts the lack of proportionality between the reward and the potential damage caused has led in certain types of contracting situations to quite <coughs> limited uh, absorption of risk by the provider of services. I think when those situations arise it is uh, really, really important that the employer, the, the organisation that is bringing the contractor in, keeps a very close eye on what is going on and really makes sure that the <coughs> contract is structured in such a way that optimises the chances that this will be accurately performed because otherwise the losses will fall back on the employer. I don't think beyond that I've got particular insights but I, I am interested and I don't know what the, the, the other panellists feel about the extent to which contractors are prepared to absorb risk and whether the balance is, shifts a lot depending on the economics of any particular time. Mark, would you like to say something I'm not sure I can answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we see in our world, at least, um, uh, what we see in terms of uh, client-contractor relationships 
is that um, quite often there's a, um, there's a perception that, uh, especially on a lump sum contract or a turnkey fixed price type contract, that the contractor has some kind of, um, they'll protect our, our interest perspective, some kind of quasi-fiduciary, uh, which of course it generally isn't the case in a contract agreement. Um, on the flip side of that, from a behavioural perspective, quite often what we see is that the starting point of the project team from the, the client rather than the contractor, is the belief that the contractor is out to shaft them from the very beginning, which isn't a very good starting point in some kind of an agreement. Um, the third point is that <clears throat> normally on, on the top of a contract, uh, uh, it says it, it is the word agreement, but quite often um, it's normally used as a disagreement. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that normally, uh, from a behavioral perspective, falls back down onto a tick box behavior that we observe across the industry, not just in the UK, but elsewhere as well, which is after signing the contract um, and spending a lot of time and a lot of money negotiating a very large, sometimes complicated agreement, um, it's then put on the shelf <coughs> and only dusted off when, um, when there's a disagreement around the place. So there's this, again, there's this sort of behavioral aspect that comes in um, and a focus aspect which, uh, which often leads to issues uh, and, uh, and relationship issues between contractor and, uh, uh, and the, um, the project sponsoring organization. Mm -hmm. so, no, but that's what we observe. Mm -hmm. Just one other, uh, I think, observation that I've heard from uh, some large organizations that provide contracting services. A lot depends on the quality of the individuals who are pricing the jobs that they're bidding for. And I'm told that there can become generational issues where uh, there can be a sort of cadre of individuals within a number of companies who are highly experienced and actually are very good at pricing jobs. They can then be handing over to much less experienced people. And for a period of time, it is very much hit and miss whether the contractors are pricing the jobs properly. Um, a lot of the situations which we see going wrong are ones where there has been simply a significant mistake at, made at the pricing level. And the employer has in fact obtained an offer that he's accepted which was much too low. And that leads, I think, to a lot of friction. I think the other things that can lead to friction uh, are the inability often between contractor and employer to deal in a mature way with unforeseen circumstances. I'm thinking of one particular project in the Middle East at the moment, uh, a sort of trophy project I'm talking about two or three trophy projects in the Middle East, but one in particular I'm thinking about, where a road is to be driven through the capital of uh, one of the, um, the states out there. And the uh, authorities in the state are <coughs> under a lot of political pressure locally because works have you know, gone at a snail's pace. Um, the reality is that the ground conditions which have been encountered were very significantly different from those which were anticipated between the employer and the contractor. But because um, you know the parliamentarians are on the back of the officials who have placed the contract, there's an actually a serious impasse has developed, which you know, any common sense observer would say, you know, there's got to be an arrangement whereby the employer recognises that there has to be an accommodation to the ground conditions. There's no point in saying that your delay damages are now you know three times your balance sheet, and that's the you know that's the NDU. That doesn't actually get people anywhere. So I think the the inability to think and respond constructively where there is genuinely a seriously unforeseen circumstance I think it's another, another major another major problem okay thank you I've got mark question mark so I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this question but I'm sure you will be <coughs> it says how important is fiscal stability in a drilling environment and what do you see happening over the next year ah two questions in one thank you. yeah how important is fiscal stability in a drilling environment? Um, not, I don't think, it, I don't think it's ab absolutely important. The, um, the, uh, uh, what we see across the, in the drilling industry is that um, uh, the rise of smaller, more focused drilling contractors that may not have, uh, um, that may that are basically opportunistic, driving into the deeper water markets. The, um, uh, the uh, uh, you know, that aren't necessarily as well capitalized as, um, uh, as the larger ones. The, um, uh, it's a, I suppose it's a difficult question to answer. 
uh, fiscal, fiscal, with the, from a fiscal stability perspective. In terms of uh, the second question, what do we see happening over the next year or so? Um, well, you know, the industry, uh, the big question we have at the moment is um, we're wondering whether or not the drilling contractors are talking themselves into a, a rates drop right now. It's almost becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy for them. The, um, everybody's talking about rate softening, whereas in actual fact the trend seems to be that um, the day rates are increasing for drilling rigs. Um, we're seeing softening in certain areas and certain types of rigs, certain types of um, uh, um, drilling contracts. But, um, but generally across the industry, the rates are still on decline. So, uh, so what do we see in the next year or so? Well, we see that there was a recent announcement of, um, by a couple of companies in terms of uh, um, you know, we're no longer going to be speculative building. So I think there'll be a, there'll be a slowdown there. <coughs> Um, the, the, the aging rigs issue is going to loom very large. We're already seeing the likes of Transocean and uh, Noble uh, spinning off uh, its aging rigs um, really quite uh, nicely, taking care of them um, through, um, through the business restructuring. Um, there's been a trend for uh, the larger drilling operators, drilling contractors, to, uh, to go to an MLP structure, which means a very different ongoing strategy for them uh, in terms of... Uh, longer contracts, chasing longer contracts. Again, what they'll give away on a longer contract is maybe a slightly less day rate, so therefore that's potentially driving the rates down, or this perception of, of a rate decrease. And um, <clears throat> uh, so, so essentially, you know, the rates will stay the same, maybe even increase, and, uh, and there'll be more bifurcation in the industry, is, is what we see over the next couple of years. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, next question is for Robert. Um, Robert stated the key was getting better people, not cutting costs. How do you propose that we do this? <clears throat> if I had the answer to that, I'd be a millionaire. I have absolutely no idea. I mean, I think that we... Uh, to that, some of the countries I've worked in have actually seen some brilliant people. Um, everybody seems to say that you know, only, only, only British we're the top of the top of the crop. That is true. Um, I've met some brilliant people in Indonesia, I've met some brilliant people in Africa, Nigeria, uh, Angola. Um, I, my project team is, uh, is basically a multi-nations task force. Um, getting better people, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's not education. Uh, we need to find a way to make people more driven. Um, and look at different different sources for people. One area that I'm very, very keen on, uh, in fact, at the end of this project, I'm taking some time off to go and do it on my own, is um, I, I've been trying to teach engineers how to become leaders for years, uh, largely failed, some successes, and I'm wondering if I can teach leaders to become engineers. So, uh, <laughs> what I'm looking at is uh, the REMI laying off vast numbers of senior NCOs and young officers, so is the, the British military in general. So, we are looking at a training program which I'm sponsoring to try and get these people into our industry. I mean, they seem to be brilliant, brilliantly minded project execution people. They've all looked like me, they've all got the same haircut, so that's a good start. They're used to being shot at, which is really as far as I'm concerned, nothing better. Uh, and they like living in shitty places, and so do I. <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, I think that that's uh, I think that that's a, I think that's a real source for future talent. Um, the end of this month, and I can't tell you the date for security reasons, believe it or not. I've been invited to 22 SES to the regimental dinner by the RSM. I'm thoroughly looking forward to my levels now. And it's really a talent spotting exercise for me. I actually might think I might find some future oil and gas engineers in that bunch of people who tend to be multilingual, project people, multilingual, not risk averse, driven. All we need to do is teach them how to engineer. And it's not that difficult. We're not building spaceships. Mark, any final thoughts on that question? Um. <clears throat> yeah, uh, you know, I am one of those people. Oh, really? yeah, so, uh, I didn't notice what you <laughs> <here. laughs> <laughs> The um, absolutely, I think I think the military do, do um, uh, does present um, uh, a good source of uh, 
uh, of potential uh, people coming in, uh, there are some interesting um, challenges, I think, uh, in terms of uh, uh, institutionalization and that sort of thing, which were very keen on my mind when I left the military and came into the oil and gas business. Um, uh, when I left, I went to university and studied engineering and found out it wasn't that difficult, you're right. So the um, uh, it, uh, attracting good people, I think, was the original question, um, and what, what can you do? The, um, it's interesting, in, 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 the, in the drilling rig sector, which is, is really our main uh, focus, what we saw in the mid-2000s uh, there was a huge dilution of competence globally across that industry. Um, it's beginning to catch up again now. Um, it tends to correct itself over time. Um, but what happened was there was a, um, uh, everybody says that, uh, you know, the majority of people in the drilling side of the business are all gray-haired and bold and fat and middle-aged and, and, and that kind of thing. It's an old part of the business. So, yeah. I wouldn't really get that. I, 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 I have no idea. I, was, I, wasn't, I didn't realize I was the face of the industry. <laughs> the, um, so, uh, um, but what they did very successfully was um, uh, uh, they brought in um, uh, a lot of uh, international workers. So, you know, what we've seen across the industry is a lot more sort of um, Indian and Pakistani workers coming in, a lot more African workers coming in, um, you know, um, uh, I, uh, you know, and then climbing the ladder very quickly, put them on, on development programs, and then eventually the competence catches up uh, and the experience comes in there. Uh, and from, uh, from an operations perspective, from a project management perspective, the initiatives that are around the place in terms of uh, what the um, APM and PMI are doing, a lot of the universities now are beginning to school and treat um, project management as a uh, as an academic study, if you like, or it's like pseudo vocational academic study, which are all which is all good good things. The um, you know the uh, um, schooling people in uh, the techniques um, is good. Uh, the big thing about projects, of course, is that um, you know you really you know get your stripes from uh, from experiencing them living them and, and, and actually living through the failures and actually finding and learning from that. So potentially there are two, uh, two aspects of how do you get good people. First you need people, you know, Robbie you seem to have some ideas around that. Uh, and secondly then you need to transfer knowledge and it's a big, uh, in, into those people and, and that's, the, for me that's the biggest challenge of the, uh, of the business globally is how do you effectively transfer knowledge. Uh, we're getting better at capturing the knowledge. Um, but then um, everybody's still failing on being able to.